And welcome to episode two of this new channel known as Quackaholics Anonymous. Last week was my introductory video where I sort of gave you an overview of how I feel about the AA program and what I think of the AA program. And it's obviously not a very high standard. I'm pretty sure you got that much of an impression by watching the first one. Uh, but uh, I was kind of trying to figure out what sort of a thing I wanted to put together for this week's video, and I think that the one thing I want to go at them with is uh, honesty. <laughs> honesty is such a basic word, and I think anybody with half a brain could make a, a really good analysis of what honesty means. I mean, I don't think we need to have 45-minute meetings about honesty, and uh, I don't think we really need a 20-year discussion, a lifetime discussion on what it means by being honest. Uh, be, I, I won't get into the the postmodernist, uh, relativist uh, type philosophical discussion about what is real and what is not, what is true and what is not, because it's really not too relevant to what we're talking about in terms of quitting drinking. I mean, quitting drinking doesn't require one to digest large philosophical texts about the nature of reality. Even though AA people with their pseudo-religious whatever it is they're doing uh, seem to make this a lot more complex than it really is. Uh, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of this one old timer I knew that would actually say this, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm directly quoting him. Uh, I used to have to rent from this bastard, so I used to hear this quite often. He would say, the only thing I need to do is work on my lying and my stealing. Uh, work on your lying and your stealing. Uh, how exactly do you work on your lying and your stealing? I mean, that's sort of something you either do or you don't, right? I mean, uh, what do you say? I've only stole, you know, like twenty, thirty dollars from some people today, so it's not my usual two hundred dollars that I steal from people on a on an average basis. So I must be making some improvement. You know, I've only told a hundred lies today. Uh, versus my usual 400 lies today. So I must be making some kind of progress, right? You know, it's another kind of funny thing that kills me about these AA meetings is they are always talking about uh, progress and not perfection. But yeah, you can't really make any progress in an AA uh, group or in the AA program because you never get to graduate. You never get to reach a plateau or a, or a peak where you can say, I'm beyond the drinking problem now. I don't no longer have a problem with drinking. I don't have an issue with it any longer. It's not a, it's no longer a part of my life in any way, shape, form, or fashion. You never really reach a point where you can actually declare in an AA meeting, I'm, I, I don't need this anymore. I'm cured. You're in a program that you can never graduate. You're in a program where you only have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of your spirituality. And that's more mumbo jumbo that I really don't want to bother analyzing, but I'm going to have to uh, to demonstrate the patent absurdity of what goes on here. I mean, I noticed uh, when I was early on, one of the first sponsors I had was always shoving that doctor's opinion down my throat, you know. Well, you have to read the doctor's opinion first. You have to get a grip of what's going on with a doctor's opinion. Well, I mean, I don't mind telling you, I'm not really bragging on myself here about anything, but I, I've always liked to read. Uh, I was one of those kids in school that just always enjoyed reading. Reading was one of my first, I guess, drugs, if you want to call it an escape from reality. That's, uh, that's where I was leading this to when I'm talking about the doctor's opinion, because uh, the, the things I saw on his opinion uh, was a little bit too melodramatic for me, for one thing, and it was kind of blatantly untrue. I mean, uh, alcoholics are in full flight from reality. Outright mental defectives. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and they go on and on with all these damning indictments of how mentally delusional you are if you have a drinking problem, which... You know, I always thought somebody with a drinking problem, I don't know, they probably do about like I did. They start off in life uh, enjoying the drinking, and somewhere along the way they start to drink a little more and a little more and a little bit too much, and then, you know, it develops into a, a pattern of destructive behavior, and that once you put that bottle down and you manage to get past all of that, which I managed to do after I got away from them, uh, you don't no longer have an issue, but the way that they're this Dr. Repinion thing and the rest of the book, which I can't get all of it in this one video, but this whole thing about uh, full flight from reality. You know, I never woke up in the morning with a bad hangover 
and was reaching under my bed to get, you know, a good bottle of vodka and get a few drinks to start my day off, saying, yeah, today I'm going to be in full flight from reality. I'm going to run from reality. Uh, I'm going to just run as fast as I can so I can drink more and more and more to to, to fly from reality. Uh, for one thing, you can't actually escape reality, okay? Reality sort of exists whether you want it to or not. You can... You can drink yourself into a stupor where you don't care about what's going on in reality, but you can't really fly away from reality. I mean, I, I, again, I won't get into the whole relativist, you know, postmodernist thing about what reality is, but I can just say sufficient enough for this top topic that we're talking about uh, in quitting drinking. Uh, if you step out of a tall window, you're going to fall. If you uh, step out in front of a car, you're going to get run over. Uh, if you drink a bottle of vodka, you're going to get drunk. Okay, this seems like it's really rather elementary uh, to rip off Sherlock Holmes here, but I'm not no Sherlock Holmes. I'm just saying it's kind of elementary to me that, you know, if you don't drink, you won't get drunk, and if you do drink, you could get drunk. And uh, I don't really see that as outright mental defective, full flight from reality, uh, and all this other uh, weird, bizarre, uh, doom and gloom, uh, damning indictment that they're trying to read off to you. I mean, granted, uh, when my drinking problem got really bad and out of control and I couldn't do anything about it, uh, it wasn't so much that I was running away as I was thinking to myself, uh, well, when it was physical, I was just trying to stop from being sick and hung over. But for the mental thing, it was like, well, you know, I'll drink me a few drinks and I won't feel this any longer. I mean, it's funny. The AA program can never decide what makes you drink. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's a it's a physical disease. It's a mental obsession. It's a it's a physical allergy. It's uh, the seven deadly sins. It's uh, resentment. No, it's not. It's selfishness. Selfishness and self-centered driven by a hundred forms of fear. You know, let's just cut all of this aside and let's just do the Occam's razor thing here. I mean, how about you didn't feel really good and you drank so you could feel a little bit better. And I didn't make that up myself. I mean, I know that from experience, but I mean, uh, if you check out the Orange Papers website, it's mentioned over and over in, in places about addiction. You do it because you don't feel good your current situation is not too nice, and when you drink, all of a sudden, for a few moments, it's it feels like everything is okay. There's a sense of euphoria. There's a sense of, I can handle these problems now. And obviously, over a period of time, as you build up tolerance, as you keep turning to your addiction or whatever, the, the path you're taking can become potentially destructive. In my case, it was very destructive, but there again, I'm not like AA. I'm not going to tell you, you know, that you have to go through that too before you understand what addiction is. I mean, and that's another little sly thing I wanted to get into before I get back onto the topic of honesty. There's a little bit, a very subtly up here that they plan in your head when you first go in, that uh, you have to be in quite a lot of pain, otherwise you would never want to quit your addiction, that you have to be at the very, very bottom before you would even dare want to try and quit your addiction. You know, there's even in there little... 12 and 12 or whatever it is, uh, you know, why all of this yearning insistence that you have to hit bottom? <laughs> Here we go again with the melodrama, you know, yearning insistence. I mean, uh, I don't know. I never saw anybody with yearning insistence that other people should hit bottom when I was in those rooms. I mean, I saw a lot of mean-spirited, bullying sons of bitches that seemed to get off on seeing people fail and fall. Uh, but that was the first thing that stuck in my mind when I was actually new to the rooms of Quackaholics Anonymous. I would think to myself, you know, I've gone through a lot of pain with all this drinking, and I've gone through a lot of agony with all this drinking, and things have gotten really bad as a result of this drinking, but I'm not buying half of the stuff they're trying to peddle to me. You know, some of this stuff just don't make sense. And, uh, what is the narrative they push on you when you're going through that, when you're a little bit confused, when you got questions about those kind of things? They say, maybe you're just not willing. Maybe you're just not honest. Or they'll even tell you something that I heard repeatedly in those rooms, and I would think you wouldn't want to tell anybody that's struggling to overcome an addiction. But I had a lot of people that would say, uh, maybe, just maybe, you have not had enough. 
Maybe you need to go out and get drunk and do more, and then maybe you'll be willing to listen to my mindless blabbering as I try to brainwash you. I mean, <laughs> you know, somebody comes to you trying to trying to seek help to overcome their addictive behavior, and you tell them to go get drunk because they're not buying hook, line, and sinker the crap you're selling. You know, but again, uh, the fact that they want you in a lot of pain, the fact that they need you in desperation uh, before they can sell you this thing is because desperate people in a lot of pain are pretty much willing to buy anything for the pain they end. You know, I can tell you that from experience. You know, when I was waking up in the morning and shaking so bad that I couldn't hold uh, a cigarette in my hands and I was reaching for a bottle, uh, you could have pretty much told me anything I wanted to hear as long as I thought there was some idea the pain would go away. Uh, and I would have probably bought it hook, line, and sinker. But, you know, there's another bit of flawed thinking in this because what if you're an individual, and I'm not counting myself among those, but there are plenty out here like this that are excluded in AA or made to feel like they need more pain in order to qualify themselves. What if you're just a guy who's drinking too much? You drink it too much, you know, your wife's not happy with it, your kids are kind of looking at you like, hey, you know, you've been showing up drunk at a few occasions at school, uh, maybe your boss is kind of calling you into his office and saying, hey, you know, you, you, you really need to do something about this drinking problem. AA is telling you that you can't do nothing about that because you're not in enough pain. You have not sufficiently bottomed out. If you get to their meetings and you say, okay, this sounds good, I want to quit drinking, but, you know, some of this stuff you're preaching at me, I mean, come on, give me a break already. Uh, they'll just tell you you're not in enough pain, that you have not sufficiently hit the rock bottom requirement needed for membership, that you have to qualify yourself. And uh, I think this narrative is actually a really rather dangerous narrative, because uh, by their logic, if you feel that you have a problem of some sort, by their logic, if you want to do something that's potentially destructive to you, uh, in the early stages of it, you're not going to do anything about it because you're not in sufficient enough pain. You should take the path all the way to the very bitter end to the point that you're nearly dead, dying, or locked up in a jail, and then you can say, oh, I'm ready to be brainwashed. I'm ready to swallow your mindless doggerel. Uh, because I know that many times over the years when I was questioning the things that were put in front of me and the, you know, uh, the things I was being told and the misgivings I had when I would read the literature, uh, I think to myself, well, what if this is because I haven't reached enough pain yet? What if, what if I just truly haven't bottomed out? And of course, finally, there's the dreadful thing they like to do to everybody in there. And they say, you know, you may be one of those who cannot be honest. <laughs> you know, constitutionally incapable of being honest. I mean, here we go again with the more, again with the fucking melodrama. You know, constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. I mean, who gets to determine that, by the way? I mean, the latest time I checked, nobody in there can, like, read your mind, you know, or, or somehow probe you in some kind of way or give you some kind of qualifying test. And the result is you're constitutionally incapable of being honest because you won't stop being in full flight from reality. You know, you're on the flight from reality train and you're not going to slow it down. I mean, the only time I know of, of situations where someone is judged to be incapable and they don't use the term of being honest, okay, is usually in cases where people are ruled too mentally incompetent to stand a trial in a situation. I remember a long time ago uh, when I was touring the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., uh, the tour guide was talking about a lady that come in there with a paintbrush and attacked all the artwork and was decim decimating the place and everything else. And after her arrest, uh, the police, you know, had referred her over to a doctor, and the doctor just ruled that she didn't know what she was doing. She couldn't be held responsible for her actions, you know, and it was a situation where they put somebody like that in a mental institution, and hopefully they get the help they need, but that, that we're dealing with a situation of someone who really, truly does not know what they're doing. You know, it's kind of funny that AA tells you to be fearless and thorough and honest from the very start, but then they'll tell you that you can't be, that you don't know the truth from the false. That you can't distinguish reality from fiction. That your only, uh, your alcoholic life is your only normal one, and you don't have any feeling that there's something wrong here. I mean, give me a break. The only reason you would want to quit drinking, 
obviously the only reason you would even want to quit drinking to begin with is because of the fact it's affecting your reality. It's affecting your day-to-day -day living. It's affecting your life. It has not a fucking thing to do with not being able to be honest. I mean, it, but it's written into their, their subtle manipulation of brainwashing. Um, in fact, I'm going to do, I might have to do a whole series of videos about this where I take apart how it works a little at a time and just, you know, gradually uh, and slowly destroy everything that's in there because it's all a lot of grand assertions uh, it's all a lot of, of these big assumptions about what everybody thinks and what everybody feels. Uh, there's no scientific evidence for any of this. There's no basis in fact. There's no statistics. AA refuses to be studied by science. I could continue this list. What is it they say in the rooms? Ad infinitum or whatever it is. I know what the Latin word means if I saw it in a book, you know. But um, there's the little subtle manipulation right there at the beginning, you know where they're telling you that you're so mentally delusional that you can't even possibly, possibly have an iota of how you're supposed to run your own life. You're so far gone mentally that there's no way you can ever connect to reality ever again, that you'll never be able to connect to reality ever again. It doesn't matter if you put the bottle down for 50 years. You're still in danger of picking it up tomorrow and dying an alcoholic death because you're in full flight from reality would not without our help you know and that's really the catch line of all this you know you have to do what we tell you to do you have to read what we tell you to read and you have to say what we tell you to say otherwise you're really doomed you know it's this is a really nice thing they'll say it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to quit drinking but then they'll tell you you die if you don't do it just the way they tell you to do it uh, what is the term? Is it Hobson's choice? I don't know. I would have to look that up. But it's one of those situations where, for instance, somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you, you either got to do what I tell you to do or I'm going to blow your brains out. And then they tell you, but it's up to you to choose what you want to do. Uh, and, uh, there's, you know, the, when, you, when you're coming in and you're new and you're a little bit fragile, they, they prey on that. They prey on that totally. And when you really think about it, the so-called rigorous honesty that they want you to put forth in those rooms, it's not honest at all, okay? Every meeting is nothing but this same narrative where everybody is almost following, following along the same script that they all have to make so they can all feed off of each other's stories and feed off each other's tales. Uh, you're not allowed to actually tell how you honestly feel in an AA meeting. You're not allowed to honestly talk about what's going on with you. You can if you want to. I mean, I know somebody out there is going to pop, pop up and they're going to say, uh, well, in my meetings this happens. I mean, we allow that. It's in my meetings. I've never seen this behavior you're talking about in my meetings. And I've been to meetings all over the world. I've been to meetings in Timbuktu in Antarctica. And I've never seen what you're talking about. Well... Okay, whatever, I don't believe you. And, you know, I've heard that line so many times from people who actually engage in that type of behavior that you don't believe you either. Maybe you're constitutionally incapable of being honest. Eh? But if you do share what's really going on with you, if you share your true feelings in a meeting, you'll notice the next four or five people after you, they all have to attack you indirectly, you know. And especially if you have a bad reaction to that, they'll say, well, I wasn't even talking about you. I was talking about my experience. When, it, you know, when it's obvious what they're doing, but you're not allowed to talk about what's really going on, about your real life or anything else. You're expected to regurgitate slogans. You're expected to pander to the older time members, the establishment, so that they'll hopefully look at you and say, yeah, you know, you're, you're finally getting this thing now. We like you. you know? <laughs> and there's also the nod and head contest. Now, I know that I'm not so delusional that... I can't be the only one out there that's not seen the nodding heads, you know, like uh, I was talking about at the beginning of this video, right? The guy says, uh, I need to work on my lying and my stealing. Well, you know, you have nodding heads depending on how much sobriety you got. Like, let's just say for the sake of argument, I come in here and say, I don't know about anybody else, but when I got here, I was willing. I was willing to do whatever it took. Now, all you got to do is look around the room and you got these, <laughs> it's funny if it wasn't so fucking tragic, but you're going to have these people going. Yeah, there was one guy, it was literally a contest with this guy, I'm serious. <clears throat> I actually had to watch him when he was doing it. 
Like somebody would say something like, well, when my sponsor took me through the fifth step and he would be sitting up there behind him and he'd be going. And then they would say something about, but then my self-will got in the way of my fifth step and he'd go. <laughs> I don't know what he's what, what these people are thinking because I've seen so many people doing this. Some of them have to even add emphasis to their head nod. Okay, It's like they practice this at home, you know. This old timer says something that everybody wants to hear. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, look, you can drop and dispense with the with this whatever this is you're doing, okay? Because they're probably not gonna call on you right after this guy talks, no matter how much you nod and pretend, because you're not one of them yet. You know, you have to do a little bit more bowing, a little bit more scraping, and you have to do a little bit more rehearsals to sound more like you're a part of them before they'll acknowledge you. Now, you can head by a ball you want, but I don't know if you think that these people are, like, paying special attention to how much you're nodding. Uh, <laughs> or I don't know what well, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, I swear, I don't know what they're doing. I've never, uh, I've never read, like, I like to read. I, I said at the beginning of this video, I've never read a book, and when I read a line in that book that specifically really spoke to me, I don't think I ever sat at the book and went, and I don't think I flipped the page and then read some tragedy and it went. I mean, what is that? I mean, and it happens so much that I know that I'm not uh, the only one imagining this. I've talked about this with other people. I mean, are we so enthusiastic here that we have to V for the attention of the speaker by hoping that the chair person will look around the room and say, who's not? Who's not in the most? Who appears to be the most enthusiastic and who appears to be the most brainwashed? I'll call on that guy next. <laughs> All right, I've had a little too much fun with that and I've talked a little bit longer uh, with an introductory topic about honesty. I think that I might even want to go a little bit more in depth uh, with what I've touched on. And I can do that in the next video because I don't have a time limit and I don't have to worry about the next five people after me talking against me, and if they do, I really don't care. I mean, I've been through too much with these people already, but I, I think this is the direction I want to go with this. I think I want to start taking apart their little how it works, their ideas of honesty, uh, and uh, a few other things, and, and that's, just the, that's just the icing on the cake, you know? I mean, there's so much stuff you can talk about with these people in terms of their phony foolishness that you literally would never be able to run out of topics, but I do want to end something on a hopeful note here. I mean, I don't want, you know, well, I don't really care what happens, but I mean, uh, I've noticed that ever since I left AA, that ever since I, I, I truly cut ties with all those people, all those people are not in my life any longer. I've actually noticed that I don't hardly ever think about drinking any longer. And I haven't had a drink in a, in a pretty long time. I don't believe in counting time anymore, I mean, because after all, you know, what am I going to do, pick up a medallion that says I've got 365 days? I mean, that never did make sense to me either, particularly when they tell you it's a one day at a time program. But I haven't had any issues psychologically with, 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 with wanting to pick up alcohol. And I'm not powerless over alcohol, and my life is certainly not unmanageable. Unmanageable. Um, if there's anything going on in my life that needs fixing today, you know how they'll do that. And today, I know, you know, in those meetings. But if there's anything going wrong in my life today <laughs> to rip them off, uh, I have to, I, I'm the one that actually has to fix that. I'm the one that actually has to take care of that. Uh, nobody else is going to do it for me. And sitting around drinking bad coffee and listening to people uh, blabber and whine and complain about how they can't do anything without God's help, uh, it never proved beneficial to me then, and now that I'm far away from it, it, it you know, it's not something I actually see any value in, you know. But then again, I think for the majority of us ordinary people out there, I mean, taking care of your own life is really not that hard, you know. You get up, you go to work, you get a bill, you have to pay the bill. If you get another bill that's unexpected, you have to get on the phone, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. It's not like we're dealing with some top secret covert operations in life if we are a common ordinary person with a drinking problem. And anyway, that's a 25 minute mark and uh, I'll probably see you back here next week. And, uh, and until that time, stay away from the meetings.